So we're going to start our streaming on YouTube. We're getting that going. Um, welcome, it, welcome, it, everyone. It, who's it's just right here. It's right here. <laughs> right here. We have someone who is uh, on the ground. <laughs> In Napa. I love it. I love it. Okay, so we have our chat open, so please feel free to chat uh, throughout the course of the event. And, um, you know, as usual, uh, we will just jump right into it. So, all right, we're going to get started right on time tonight. Yeah, 32 minutes after is a pretty well, good time. Yeah, to start. we'll get started. You know, it's like it's good to reward those who come on time. Well, we we'll also have like a two minute introduction, anyways. So, <laughs> I think that kind of also helps uh, balance it out. So, yeah. hi, I'm Steven. And I'm Beth. And we are Veni Vini Amici. We do wine education and outreach. Uh, we're offering it free. We dive into different topics thematically, but instead of um, kind of we focus on the tasting notes and the characteristics of the wine at the end of the lecture. Prior to that, we really focus on trying to present different aspects of the wine, such as geography, like where's California? Uh, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that topic, a little bit of history. Geography, um, you know, what, what soil. There's a, there's a lot of fun. Oh, we are going to talk soil. about the soil this evening. Talk a little bit about American viticulture areas, known as ABAs. There's going to be a lot of fun topics, so stay tuned. Stay <laughs> tuned. So where is California? This is this is going to get progressively more and more difficult, people. So it's on our west coast, right there. Yay! Some For of those our... of you on the west coast right now, hello. It's <laughs> <laughs> <That's> so wonderful. <laughs> Lo loved Brent's uh, you know audience participation to say it's right here. <laughs> that was wonderful. So where is Napa? So Napa is located fairly close to the coast, just north of San Francisco. Um, when we dive in a little bit deeper, we can kind of see some of the surrounding cities. We're getting a, a sense of place here. Um, yeah, you know, you can just take a flight over to San Francisco, get a car, drive up, enjoy the wine country. Something we have not done yet, but I'm no doubt we will. And one of the there is a shuttle there right is a... from SFO to the Excellent. heart of Napa. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, and we are going to get into the Napa region. Has become, you know, where did it come from, and then how did it get to where it is today? And that's going to be kind of the course that we're going to go through this evening is how do we go from, um, you know, the original German immigrants that started the big families that or well, houses that became big and then um, get to the point where we have some vineyards that have helipads in their front yard. Right. And it is almost Disneyland for adults. You know, so here's a beautiful sign as you enter into the Napa Valley. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Welcome. So. Geography of Napa, there's a few important things to note. So we have two mountain ranges and a river. And um, I'm going to probably mispronounce these as I am not a native Californian, so I do apologize in advance. But we have the Vaca Range, and that is the mountain range that's going to shield Napa from the heat of the Central Valley. So this is really crucial. A lot of wine comes from California, but believe it or not, only about 4% comes from Napa Valley. It is so famous worldwide because of the quality, but in terms of volume, that's more Central Valley. And so that's going to be a much hotter region. So we're protected from that by the Vaca Mountains. And then the Mayakamas separate Napa from the cooler marine influence. So Sonoma, right next door, is getting a whole other experience. They're getting a lot more of that ocean breeze and that's affecting their terroir. Now a little bit of that will leak into the Napa Valley and that will affect different regions in there. but. But it, this mountain range um, on the western side is protecting it uh, very much from that. And the final element is the Napa River itself, which bisects the valley. And it starts out quite small as more of a creek. And by the end, it's fully navigable. So um, that is kind of the overview of the geography there. And um, it's about 30 miles long and between one to five miles wide. So we're not talking a really huge region here. Not, not that big at all. Um, one of the interesting things to put all of that into perspective is that the Napa region actually has colder climates further south because the Pacific influence is coming through the waterways is actually um, 
impacting the region more in the south than it does in the north. The north does have some cold influences from the Pacific as it comes through the passes of the Mayacamas Mountains, um, but it's much stronger of an influence in the south. So it's just kind of um, when you're thinking about it, you know, you normally say like the further north I go, the colder it is, but it's not quite true for the Napa region because of that Pacific influence being able to come sneak in mm -hmm. um, around the Mayacamas Mountains. There's also the factor of altitude. So often when we talk about Napa, and I'll, I'll keep saying this throughout the evening, there's kind of two large categories that you can think about. While there are many, many sub-regions, and we'll get into that, you can think about the hillside and the valley floor. But something to keep in mind about the valley is that it's not really a valley in the sense that it evokes when you say the word valley. It's actually uh, rolling hills, and that allows for really wonderful um, vineyards. And, mm -hmm. you know, if it were if it were really just a basin, it'd be it'd be almost too fertile to have such wonderful um, wine growing. So, so you will at the altitudes on the hillsides, you'll get a little bit cooler, but you still get that full sun exposure for ripening. Right, and so that's. Um, one of the themes that we talk about very, very often in this is that uh, the more fertile your soil is, the less the grapes struggle, and the less the grapes struggle, um, the less concentration you have. So the, you want them to struggle on the hillsides where um, nutrients are um, less. And so in that sense, we get concentrated grape juice and, and phenolics, and that's the flavor components that go into the wine and then we can um, get greater expressions when the wine is finally made. Right, whereas in the valley actually um, you need to do a lot of crop management because it's, it is more fertile, there's a lot more growth, so they'll actually end up throw, cutting and throwing away fruit. And so that's called green farming and we're going to talk about that in a little bit later too, but uh, green farming is when you at the uh, beginning, like right after the grapes have formed, um, after bud break, and again, right before verasion, you cut different berry clusters and just drop them on the ground um, because you want to thin the herd, if you will, and then the remainder becomes more concentrated in flavors. Yeah, the plant will throw all of its efforts into what's left. <laughs> One of the other important aspects about Napa um, is when we're thinking about the geography of this, um, is that our latitude lines compared to Europe are, are um, getting a lot more sun exposure because they're a little bit lower, um, closer to the equator. And because of that, we use canopy management. And this is um, with the same, compared to the same varietals, such as in Bordeaux um, to Napa for our Cabernet Sauvignon. You wanna have a, typically a little bit more um, canopy management, a little bit more cover to kind of shield from the sun. Otherwise you'll, you know, um, what is it? Sunburn. You can get sun, they can get sunburned, yeah. So Napa is experiencing a dry Mediterranean climate, but as as we mentioned, you know, it, it's it's Europe and and the United States wine growing regions are at different latitudes, so you mm -hmm. can get very different results. Yep. Um, so we've outlined um, some of the <clears throat> some of the towns here in Napa, um, and it's it's very interesting because it's just one road shot, and we're going to get into the tourist in a little bit. But before we get into tourism we're gonna talk about AVAs, right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, Napa County, Napa AVA was established. In um, 1981. Yeah. And it actually, it, they, I'm sure they would love to say that they're the first, but they are in fact the second American viticulture area known as AVA. The first is actually east of the Mississippi or right around the Mississippi in Missouri. So a little bit unusual for American viticulture history, but Napa is number two, 1981. and um, subsequently, since that time, 16 sub-AVAs have um, been formed and they're nested AVAs. That means that they all fall within the Napa Valley AVA, but they're sub-regions within. And, the, and you can see the colors on the slide sort of indicate um, the, the different AVAs. So they're not labeled, but that gives you an idea of the kind of spatial distance. And Right. And you know, one of the comments that we heard was these look like crisp, clean lines between the different regions. So how does an AVA get established then? Because they look like they're man-made lines. And, and they are. The, the AVA is um, a classification that comes through the TTB. And so an organization um, operating for kind of um, signifying an area will use geology reports, climate reports to try to show that this specific area has commonalities 
which can then prove that like you could have terroir come from there. Um, would you like to talk about one of the big distinctions between AVAs and... Yes, yes. So one of the important things, okay, to think about with AVAs. So AVAs, American Viticulture Areas, you might think to yourself, well, um, maybe they're analogous to the different geographical designations in Europe. So if we've talked about Italy a lot, you have the DOCs. In France, you have AOCs. And these are regions that are, you know, great growing areas with distinctive wines um, but one of the big differences, and there, there are many, but one of the big differences between ABAs and the geographical regions designated in Europe is that in Europe there's a lot more control over the winemaking and over the crop yield, over the type of grapes, all, all kinds of things, but especially the winemaking. You really don't see that with ABAs. So while in tiny regions in France like Tavel, they're famous for their rosé, it's the only thing that they do. You know you know if you're buying that, you're buying a rosé. With Napa, the Napa AVA, um, the winemaker has a lot more choice about what they can do. And so they still get to put Napa on the label as long as 85% of the fruit comes from Napa. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other interesting things about Napa, compared to even other AVAs in the United States, is that you have dual labeling? Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So um, that's becoming more popular in the United States. But um, as I mentioned there, the nested AVAs, so you have the overarching Napa Valley AVA, and then you have sub AVAs like Rutherford. They actually, the labeling is such that you will see both. And this is good for the consumer, good for the brand. It, you know, not everyone might be familiar with all 16 sub AVAs, but it'll have both Napa and the sub AVA written on there. And so the bottle that we have this evening has um, just Napa County. So it does not dis you know, f rise to the level of being able to distinguish itself inside of one of the other um, 16 AVAs. And so therefore we have Napa County and it doesn't make it a lesser wine. It's just um, people within those AVAs are trying to um, work together to create a sense of place and popularity. Yeah, I mean, they might be pulling from different AVAs for a variety of reasons to get one particular characteristic, pull from another for another. So um, the winemaker not have, might have not have felt limited to that. And so, you know, we talked about how you have to have um, soil as a part of your AVA, which is really an interesting topic for Napa because there's just so many different soil types, right? right? So out of the three major categories, if you're a, a soil expert, there are a dozen or so major categories of soil on the planet. Napa has about half of them. They have 33 soil types and 100 plus soil variations. So this is a, this very colorful map is illustrating just how many different soil types are present in Napa. And the reason is, like a ton of geological events have happened. So over the last 150 million years, we've had tectonic plate movement, volcanic activity. There's been erosion, erosion. There's been encroachment of the San Pablo Bay. There's also been flooding of the Napa River. So all of these different events are happening. You know, a lot of other places, maybe a couple of big geological events happened, but here almost everything happened. And that created this extremely diverse soil environment, which has allowed it to become a playground of winemaking because you have this place that has this incredibly consistent vintage to vintage, at least historically, things might be changing, but Mediterranean climate, and then you have all these soils you get to play with. And so when we talk about soil types, and we're not gonna dive super far into it today, it's just like a little bit of a teaser. We're gonna slowly add more and more of these little factoids about rocks. soil types and rocks <laughs> and throughout our lectures. Um, but you can think about it, the more organic material that exists in the soil that can get imparted into um, the wine. And it changes the structure, the flavor profile. Um, when we have um, you know, less organic soils, the roots have to keep diving mm -hmm. deeper, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you have different porosities, right, then the roots have to dive to find water, right? Um, so the again, the more they struggle, the more um, the plant itself changes, right? So when we think about what um, is above ground, it's almost, you know, the the wine starts in the ground. Right? Oh, absolutely. Because the, the roots are, are really, really important. How far down do those roots go and what interactions are they having with the types of soil? Absolutely. And the soil type, you know, that's going to affect 
what rootstock is chosen, what grape varietal is chosen, even potentially what clone is chosen. The, you know, when, when, when planting a vineyard, they might make decisions based on that soil type, based on the elements that you were just discussing. You know, and talking about selection of rootstock is a really interesting conversation to have because, you know, a starting vineyard wants to get grapes online so that way they can start manufacturing uh, wine, producing wine. Um, so certain types of rootstock grow really slowly, but they grow strong and they extract nutrients and um, they don't, they'll grow, they'll focus their efforts down as opposed to up. And those are sought after um, in certain circles of wine production because they feel that higher quality wines are produced from them. It takes a lot longer to get them online though because they're spending their energy going down into the ground as opposed to producing fruit above ground. Um, whereas some places will opt into having um, rootstock that focuses on sending the nutrients up to the plant, um, which allows you to have higher yields um, earlier. And so therefore you can make more wine and then maybe, you, you know, and so it's just, a, there's a lot of business that goes in when you're selecting what type of rootstock, what type of wines to make um, mm -hmm. um, and your location of where you want to be. Okay, so let's get into the tourism of Napa, right? So we highlighted the AVAs. Um, They're we shown see them again on the map. in their rainbow colors here. And this is a very busy slide here. Uh, really, the big takeaway is to go to tourism websites. If you're going to go travel to a wine region, um, they have just a wealth of information that can help catch you up to speed. Um, you know, this map highlights not only those AVAs that exist and the airports that you can fly into and the routes that you can take. Um, the website highlights uh, bicycle tours that exist. This oh, yeah. Napa is one of the most visited wine regions in the world. It's one of the wine regions with the most number of Michelin star restaurants. This is a fantastic place to visit. Spas, restaurants, wineries. And everything. you see on the on the uh, you know in the on the maps here. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh yeah yeah right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the tourism website has these four identified city centers, and they allow you to basically just walk around and visit a ton of tasting rooms. And these are the tasting rooms for vineyards um, that have already produced their wine, oftentimes, and then they just have their tasting rooms in a city collectively, so that way you can get um, sample a lot of different Napa uh, wines all at the same time. Um, one of the things, and we're going to get into the history of what put Napa on the map, but what's important to know is that it is on the map. It has international recognition, um, and that allows for talent to be driven there, mm -hmm. right? UC Davis is just to its south, so people that are graduating can go just right up north. They can get internships, and they're not that far away from their campus. Um, and if you have great wine that's being produced and a lot of buzz, then you can get um, charge a higher you know, value, uh, higher price for it. Oh, absolutely. The The cost of vineyard land in Napa is some of the highest in the world. Right. And that motivates um, vintners to come in. The highest, uh, you know, talented uh, vintners come in because not only is can they get, uh, you know, the biggest bang for their buck, if they will, for the, for the good vintages, but Napa itself, because of the way it's nestled between those mountains and the influences of the Pacific Ocean, has very consistent uh, vintages year after year. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, th and that is changing a little bit, but it has been thus far very true. And I think it's, it's definitely one of the secret sauces of success because um, a many... And, and many regions in Europe do enjoy something similar, but many regions in Europe um, struggle year to year. Some vintages can be very, very poor. Yep. Um, so yeah, so you have the best vintners that want to go there. And then of course the food follows, as Beth said, um, tons of Michelin restaurants. Um, oh yeah. And, and so the French Laundry being one of, arguably one of the most famous restaurants in the United States, the world perhaps. The world. Um, and then it just makes it uh, a great place to go as a tourist because you get amazing wine, amazing people that are there. Um, and amazing food. So, yeah, absolutely. That's our spiel on on visiting Napa, which we will do someday. <laughs> and it looks like this, which is gorgeous. I mean, <laughs> I uh, perfect I, weather all the time. I did clip the weekly weather for for Napa, and I meant to go on this slide just because 
uh, to showcase that it's, you know, what, sunny in 70, low 80s, you know, Sounds perfect. perfect. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> um, but now getting into a little bit of the history, right? So please feel free in the chats to write your tasting notes and everything. And I hope that everybody's been drinking along with us um, because it's hopefully a relaxing time. So this yes, region... don't wait for us. Yeah, don't wait for us to start. <laughs> um, so Schramsberg is one of the families, uh, one of the guys uh, who came over from Europe and uh, he had a little bit of a background in viticulture and, you know, trained a little bit, but really his, his trade was a barber. And, uh, and then he was able to, you know, buy land, build a chateau and, and start farming. Um, he did die in the early 1900s and then we had prohibition in the United States. So, um, you know, the plot went into disrepair basically um just was abandoned uh, and it, it wasn't until the davies family came back that revitalized it um the davies family kept the name schramsberg um mainly because uh the, the a nod to the history and the caves that exist there um Schramms, Schramm, inspired them to do sparkling sparkling wine yeah and schramsberg is uh one of america's first sparkling wine and especially with chardonnay that's their blanc de blanc mm -hmm. has been noted throughout american history and yes uh, they so previously um i believe that the, there was sparkling wine in california but it was made out of a lot of different grapes that you're not familiar with but as steven mentioned they are the first to do chardonnay and pinot noir style which if you recall are the two two of the major grapes in the champagne blend Ooh, to get kind of uh, with the Schramsberg label here. Um, they were producing uh, sparkling wine in California and they had um, sh California champagne on their label. Uh, and then it wasn't until the uh, geographical, the GI with the trademark office um, working in the international spectrum, um, worked out the negotiations that California champagne can be on the label um, as long as they were grandfathered in once champagne became the kind of the, the holder, the sole holder of the term champagne. Yeah, I think the California champagne um, topic actually held up treaties between France and the United States for a long time. Champagne fiercely defends their label. And actually, as it turns out, they share that in common with Napa because Napa uh, is constantly... Um, working to defend their name around the world in China and other places where a lot of people want to put Napa on the label, but they don't have the fruit. Exactly. But one of the interesting things that Schramsberg um, did was that they saw the treaty come in and then they dropped California champagne from their label. Uh, they got EU recognition for it. Um, but also one thing to kind of consider is that when you see California champagne, that doesn't tell you how the production of the wine was made. So if everybody can recall from tank method, champenois method, or even CO2 injection method, if you were grandfathered in to uh, be able to use California champagne, you could change your style. Again, AVAs and terminologies yeah, doesn't, no yeah, there's no requirement on how you produce it. And so if you see champagne, uh, California champagne, it might not even be made in the in the champenois method and so uh, schramsberg chooses to put uh method champenois on their menu on their label and uh, to indicate that it is made in the traditional method um yeah just some little factoids there yeah uh behringer still exists two brothers came over um they worked in some cellars and they bought an estate and then built a a huge mansion on there you know when you look back at history it's really fascinating to see how far uh, you could get in terms of land acquisitions and uh, building structures um, so very interesting to see and so Beringer is still uh, around today they did stop um, producing wine uh, they just kind of they grew grapes and they sold them uh, you know, so that's a very interesting thing to consider is that that leap from 1875, you have prohibition. Um, and then we also have the second round of flocks for that we'll talk about in a little mm -hmm. bit as well. Um, you know, and so people had to shut their doors. They had to um, make... Uh, the only way they could survive was mm -hmm. to, if they wanted to make wine, to make sacramental wine. Sacramental right? wine, yeah. yeah. Um, or rip up their rootstocks and plant grapes. A lot um, of a lot of you know crop 
crops come from California, as you know, a lot of produce is grown there. So some people decided that it wasn't worth it to keep growing grapes that couldn't make wine. They pulled, yeah, they pulled everything up. They started growing other things. Oh. Kind of sad. Uh, moving right along, we saw we have Freemark Abbey that was established in 1898. Uh, they're still open. They have tastings and uh, that you can still go visit. They were in the Judgment of Paris. This is how we're going to introduce the Judgment of Paris is to talk about Freemark Abbey because in that Judgment of Paris, and that's when the wines of California went against the biggest and best of um, of Europe or of France. In 18, sorry, 1976, not yeah. 1876. <laughs> 1976. And so we have um, Chardonnay coming out of the Burgundy region against the Bordeaux blends coming out of Bordeaux. And Freemark was uh, the first blind tasting Chardonnay at that Judgment of Paris. But the Judgment of Paris is most notable for the Chateau Montalena, which was established in 1888. Chateau Montalena won that Judgment of Paris and forever put Napa and American wine on the map. That's Yes, they won the, the white competition and California also won the red competition with Stag Leaf's wine cellar. Their red beat out all of the French reds in a blind tasting. It was and a big deal. It was a big deal. And we talk about this. Apparently there is some controversy about the film Bottle Shock. There are those who are more familiar with the story who feel like some liberties were taken but if you're looking for a fun you know movie uh we we did enjoy it there's pretty people in it you know, yeah it's a lot of fun so bottle shock is a movie made about the judgment of paris so check it out i think i saw it on yeah. one of the streaming one services the streams. recently so you know and the interesting thing about these tasting events that we've had is um, when we were in person we were able to pick up a bottle of chateau montalena and try it and it has this wonderful amount of, of oaking right so That's it's not right. it's not over oaked it's not super buttery but it lets you know that it's there and so very um, much in the style of white burgundies if you've ever had one yeah so it was absolutely lovely um still making quality wine today yeah um charles krug not to be conf uh, confused with uh krug the champagne krug um was established and it you know always had this air of producing quality wines um and we're gonna get to krug in a second and because it's very important for the mandavi family now we're not gonna go so much into robert mandavi because um that's a whole other wine lecture in and of itself and should be paired with a mandavi <laughs> wine yeah but we're gonna talk about the history of the mandavi family with this picture. <laughs> so what was happening in Prohibition? Um, and I got this tip from, I think the last time we did uh, the lecture on Napa was that people would make grape juice, freeze it and ship it in refrigerated containers across the United States. See, because when Prohibition came into effect in January 16th, 1920, the Volstead Act made it very clear that you cannot um, sell juice that will be immediately made into wine, right? That's illegal. Um, also, you can't like sell grapes knowing that it's just going to be made into wine as well. Um, so um, there was people that would ship wine grapes across the United States. If you guys remember from our Zinfandel lecture, um, one of the issues with the Zinfandel grapes has very thin skin. And so when it gets loaded into um, the train cars and shipped, uh, it would break. Um, and then you get mold and everything else. And so unfortunately, that's one of the reasons they ripped up a lot of Zinfandel. Mm -hmm. And there's very precious few places with old vines Zinfandel anymore. Yep. Uh, and the Cabernet Sauvignon has a, a thicker skin, so it could make the journey on the train cars. Now, that being said, other people innovated how to get grape juice across the United States. And so they would freeze these bricks in refrigerated cars and ship it across. But in the Volstead Act, it clearly said you cannot sell a product that is intended to be made into wine. And so they very clearly wrote instructions on how not to process the wine or the juice in order to make wine. It went through two court cases and um, you know, and it was it was a very interesting thing because everybody knew that they were being shysters. <laughs> Uh, yes, do not ferment this juice. <laughs> do not leave it in a cool place, uh, in, a, in a clear glass sterilized jar for six to 12 days. Um, 
but it was upheld in court. They won. They were allowed to uh, have the anti-wine recipe, if you will. So how does that get to the Mandavi family? So we have uh, Sari. Hmm. Well, uh, I forget. How do you pronounce that? Vino, C- Vino Sano, Oh, Cesar. Cesar, sorry. Cesar Mandavi. It's been a long day. So Cesar Mandavi um, was Robert Mandavi's father. And he was working in the supermarkets as kind of um, seeing how things were shipped, uh, you know, across trains and everything else. And he saw this product. Um, it basically took grape juice and the grape juice per volume between the beginning of Prohibition um, and the middle of the Prohibition went up like 3,400%. So he's like, I need to get in on that. So he goes out and he buys some land out in California in the Napa region and he starts producing wine to make this, this these grapes. And, you know, it's not really the focus at this point to make high quality wine. And in 1943, Robert Mandavi convinced his father that they should be the ones to buy the Krug house. And so we got a picture of Robert Mandavi and his wife the way they are today. And so that kind of inspired the start of Robert Mandavi um, was to be able to be in this world um, and then focus on the idea that after Prohibition, 1943, take the opportunity of the Krug estate going um, up for sale um, having the family, you know, have enough wherewithal and, and financial means to be able to purchase that, and then to really um, focus on quality. Right. Robert Mondavi has been an incredibly important character to Napa. He was a tireless advocate. You know, one of the things I read about him that I thought was fascinating was that, you know, at the time that things were getting started after Prohibition and American wine was really coming online. Um, it wasn't very common to consider wine with dinner and and he was an advocate of like no you have you have wine with dinner this is what is done in Europe and it's what we can do with American wine as well because American wine is becoming quality wine now and and that made a huge impact on on Napa wine but also I think all California and it's really important he played a really important role yeah um yep so now to the wine that we're drinking today so we sourced this from Wine Access, and one of the great things, the reason why we selected this bottle, right? It says, you know, Napa County, we know that it's Napa, we know that it's a Chardonnay, but the selling point for me was this 2018. The 2018 vintage for Napa was near perfect. What was it? It was, uh, oh my gosh, am I gonna get it right? Uh, <laughs> Heavenly hang time and phenomenal phenolics. I took that from the Napa Vintners Association website, um, and I just thought that was amazing. So, you know, what does that mean, though? What what is heavenly hang time? So, one of the things that can happen when you're in a growing season is weather can interrupt. Um, you know, choosing when you get to harvest, you might need to harvest earlier or later. Um, based on uh, cli- climatological, you know, and weather events. But if you have a perfect growing season, you get to choose when to pick the exact right day. And so heavenly hang time and phenomenal phenolics, you know, that when you were able to choose to pick the grapes at the right time, you're able to choose the perfect balance of the different acids and the tannins so that you can make a wine that is in balance and, and really wonderful. And it also allows for... Um, just ease, right? It's um, it's it's an easier game if you have to, you know, struggle to find labor to to pick at a certain day, and you know everybody in the whole valley knows that this is going to be the week. Then all of the the labor is going to be tied up. But now you can kind of play some games where it's like, okay, I have a little bit more wiggle room and some, you know, a three to five day window, and everybody in the valley is kind of in the similar similar boat. And so you, just, you know, there's just some some kind of macro level things at play that allows the 2018 vintage um, to be explorable with other labels that you might not have heard of because people have the opportunity to to produce really high quality and tasty wines um, in the 2018 vintage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, one of the things you'll notice is as we talked about, this does not have a sub AVA. But we, I mean, we like to play a little guessing game about where we think it's from. You know, as I mentioned earlier, um, you can kind of talk about Napa's valley, 
floor or hillside. Now typically the valley floor is gonna have more lush tannins and, and more of a black cherry. And as we talked about, again, that's because the valley floor is a bit more fertile. Um, the tannin structure is going to be a bit more lush. The hillside is gonna have a bit more acidity, a bit more backbone, a little bit, little bit, you know, rustic tannins, you might say. Um, and as you're tasting, you can imagine, you know, maybe it's a blend. Maybe you think that falls in one category or another. Mm -hmm. um, you might like one style over the other, and in which case you can try to seek out you know, Cabernet, in this case, Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa, from particular regions based on what your personal tastes are. Exactly. And that's a great conversation to have. Like, what are the typical tasting notes of a Napa, uh, you know, of a just a Cabernet in general? And so Wine Folly puts these out there as kind of general ideas to start thinking mm -hmm. about. Like mm -hmm. if you have an idea of, um, you know, what the root can be and then you can kind of think about it and then choose to go in, in a different direction, if you will. So yeah, um, these are for, for general Cabernet. I mean, Napa is particularly known for more black currant, pencil lead, a bit more tobacco. Um, sometimes you get some mint. Um, but also blackberry, and I personally am getting a lot of blackberry tonight. I do get a lot of blackberry. <laughs> and also there's, um when they say tobacco, it's, it's generally like some type of tobacco leaf, not like a cigarette. Cigar box. Cigar box. It's very and cigar would be um, a different tasting note. And there are wines mm -hmm. that have those essences. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so at this point in time, we are going to conclude our lecture. Uh, thank everybody in the YouTube world who tuned in live or later. Um, we are going to be signing off now and then opening it up to the live discussion with our in-house audience. All so. right, so everyone who's staying for the discussion, hang in there. We're, and everyone on YouTube, thanks for attending. Have a wonderful Like, comment, evening. and subscribe. <laughs> Okay, the YouTube is 